Sycamore City Council is now in session. Would the clerk please take the roll? Councilmember Culver? Present. Councilmember Marshall? Present. Councilmember Sasson? Present. Councilmember Shrebnik? Here. Councilmember Lutzis? Here. Deputy Mayor O'Kane? Here. Mayor Herbig? Here. All present. Next on the agenda is our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the city of Kenmore is situated upon the ancestral lands of the Snohomish, Snoqualmie, Soxhawtl, Duwamish, Stillaguamish, Tulalip, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and other tribes who are part of the Coast Salish peoples. We recognize and express our deepest respect for their enduring stewardship and profound relationship with this land, which they have cherished and protected since time immemorial. We honor the first peoples, acknowledge their vibrant cultures, and commit ourselves to learning from their wisdom in our journey to promote justice, equity, and mutual understanding. We pledge to stand alongside these communities in acknowledging past injustices and working towards a future that respects and celebrates the diverse heritage of this land. Now, would you all please stand and join me in the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Unless there are any objections, the agenda will stand approved. Seeing no objections, the agenda is approved. Uh, we have two proclamations today. First one is for Earth Day. <clears throat> Whereas the health and vitality of our planet is essential for the well being of all living beings, including humans, animals, and plants. And whereas each year's recognition of Earth Day is an opportunity to demonstrate a continued effort of conservation and protection, and whereas the observance of Earth Day serves as a reminder of our collective responsibility to protect and preserve the environment for current and future generations, and whereas we acknowledge that the global challenges of environmental degradation, climate change, and food and water shortages are the crises of our generation, and whereas expanding environmental education and climate literacy is vital to enhance awareness about the environment, inform decision-making, and protect this planet for the future. And whereas this council has continued its commitment to promote environmental stewardship, including water, air, forests, and habitat restoration and preservation through the city's climate action plan implementation. And whereas by commemorating Earth Day, we reaffirm our commitment to safeguarding this world and its resources for future generations. Now, therefore, I, Nigel Herbig, Mayor of the City of Kenmore, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim April 22nd, 2024, as Earth Day throughout the City of Kenmore. The Council encourages all residents, businesses, and visitors of Kenmore to observe Earth Day by educating, encouraging, supporting, and volunteering to protect and preserve our Earth. And here to, um, I'm going to kick it over to the City Manager to speak a little bit about um, Mariana LaSalle, who will be accepting this proclamation. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. We're really lucky to have Mariana LaSalle and her family here. They recently moved to Kenmore, what, a couple of years ago? About that, yeah. And Mariana has a lot of um, background in this area, um, and she volunteers a lot of her time to help uh, with the environment. Um, she helps with habitat restoration projects, organic gardening in Lake Forest Park, and she's also on our climate action advisory committee. So, and if that weren't enough, she just became a United States citizen about two weeks ago. So congratulations, Mariana. Would you like to say a few words? All right, floor is yours. Um, I wanted to just, underline that Earth Day is both a moment for education and action, and it will always been. And I am very happy because here in Canmore, we have plenty of opportunities to take action on that day and around that day because it, uh, it happens on a weekday this year. Um, before you can go uh, volunteering for habitat restoration that's um, near Swamp Creek with um, the Snow King Watershed Council. You can go um, pick up trash at Lawadis Park with uh, thoughtful citizens. And the weekend after that, the city is organizing an Earth Day event. 
celebration. And you can also volunteer there at Rhododendron Park. And all those are great ways to get engaged. I also want people to educate themselves. You can just go to your library and that's already an action to do because there are plenty of resources out there to help you be good um, environmental stewards. And that I think is the most important thing for Earth Day. And the last thing, tell your elected officials what you want to do. Your voice matters and our residents' voice matters. Would you join us over by the flag for a photo? Next, we have a proclamation for Arbor Day. Whereas trees play a vital role in sustaining life on earth by providing oxygen, purifying the air, conserving soil, and supporting diversity. And whereas Arbor Day is a time-honored tradition first started in 1872 that celebrates the importance of trees and encourages the planting of trees for the benefit of present and future generations. And whereas trees enhance the beauty of our landscapes, improve the quality of our environment, and contribute to the health and well being of our community. And whereas Kenmore benefits not only environmentally from trees, but also economically with increased property values, enhancements in the economic vitality of business areas, and the added beauty to our city. And whereas by promoting tree planting and conservation efforts, we can enhance the resilience of our urban and rural forests and strengthen our commitment to environmental sustainability. And whereas the council recognizes the value of trees in mitigating climate change, reducing air and water pollution and providing essential habitat for wildlife. Now, therefore, I, Nigel Herbig, mayor of the city of Kenmore on behalf of the city council do hereby proclaim April 26, 2024 as Arbor Day throughout the city of Kenmore. The city makes this proclamation to celebrate Arbor Day and to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands. We reaffirm our dedication to preserving and enhancing the natural beauty and ecological health of our community for generations to come. And uh, Mr. City Manager, you wanted to say a few words about Paul Westfall who will be accepting this? Yes, um, so Paul lives and breathes all of this, uh, trees and ecological conservation. His This is his day job and in addition to that, he volunteers regularly here at the city to help with habitat restoration projects with the Snow King Watershed Council and the efforts being led by Tracy Bonashinsky. So we see Paul at the Saturday projects pretty much almost every time, uh, just about. I'm looking at Tracy, she's nodding. So uh, Paul really dedicates his heart and soul to this area and we really appreciate all he does for us. So thank you, Paul. Paul, would you like to join us up at the flags for a photo? Now for my personal favorite part of the meeting, uh, Mr. City Manager, where's the fun? You know, I'd like Lauren Homiak, our communications specialist, to try and do her best to answer that question, where is the fun? Where is the fun? Well, recently the fun was right on the slew. So this past Saturday, April 13th, was the eighth annual Kenmore Hydro Cup. In addition to the races on the slough, this event included appearances by past drivers, vintage inboards, and a jet sprint boat on display. Spectators enjoyed great views from along the slough with crowds gathering to watch from the Sammamish River Bridge and also from Tlahwadis Park. 
And this historic event began long before eight years ago on March 4, 1934, the first Sammamish Slough race was held on the Sammamish River. And within a few years, the motorboat race grew into a large annual event attended by tens of thousands who marveled at the thrills and the spectacular races. The event paused in 1976. However, the slew race came back in the form of the Kenmore Hydroplane Cup event, which made its grand return back in 2014. Um, so a big thank you to the Kenmore businesses who sponsored the event, uh, 192 Brewing and US Plywood Supply. And also thank you to some of our Kenmore residents, Dave Peterson, Perry Clausen, and Suzanne Greathouse, who provided some of these really fun event photos um, taken right directly there on the slew. So that's where the fun was. Um, thank you, Lauren. I understand that Marita Colburn was the main point of contact with the slew race, and she did a great job coordinating on the city side. And in those photos, um, you saw, you might have seen a goose racing a hydroplane. I'm told that the goose won that race. So, yeah. And also, you may have seen um, the the one picture of the the folks um, standing out on the lookout points at at Tlahuadis Park. That is a vision come true. That's exactly what we had in mind when we built those lookout points at the park. So. Pretty cool stuff. And that's exactly where I was sitting with my dad for the first probably two hours of the races before we decided to go over to 192. Um, as somebody who grew up in this area and used to go down to uh, watch the races um, at Seward Park, uh, it's been really fun to watch these uh, races come to Kenmore and, and uh, share that. My dad just loves coming up and watching it. So um, it was a good time. I'd encourage everybody to hit, hit talk while he's next time that's coming because it's a wonderful place to view. Um, next on the agenda, public comments. Uh, welcome to the council's meeting. Uh, please address your comments to the mayor and council. Folks will have three minutes to speak. The clerk will call your name. When is your turn? Please state your name and city of residence and keep within the allotted time to make every person feel welcome and safe here. Please refer, refrain from booing, clapping, heckling, yelling, or other interruptions. The meeting is being recorded for transparency. Thank you for being here and for sharing your input respectfully. Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. We have two guests on site wishing to speak, Mariana LaSalle and Elizabeth Mooney, followed by three guests virtually, Stacey Valenzuela, Patrick O'Brien, and Janet Hayes. Ms. LaSalle. Again, um, this time around, I'm gonna talk about environment as well. Um, I am thrilled that the city is applying for grants to protect the shoreline along the Lake Point uh, property that is an amazing progress because this is so this is a property at the connection between a lake and a river and those freshwater river uh, ecosystems are vital because they act as a door between lake uh, ecosystems and river ecosystems and they're slightly different but this is a critical place and doing restoration work there is gonna be amazing for salmon, but for the whole ecosystem. That being said, um, I've heard also from some residents that they, in, inside the property, they were suggesting to have a sports field in that same area as an outdoor activity park. I agree that outdoor activities is essential for mental health, and physical health, and but I think there are better ways to use a park there and to implement a park than a ball field or a sports field park. Why? Because of environmental consideration. You cannot do restoration work on the shoreline and then install something either with natural turf, which is known with um, several studies that it's gonna increase drastically our greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gases emissions, which is a bit counterintuitive if we have a climate action plan to decrease those. Um, for example, an Australian study did this to compare turf between um, sports field and non-sports field and the increase in production of nitrous oxide, which is the third offender in all of the greenhouse gases was more than 2.5 times than the 
uh, total emissions. So that in this is great for such a small uh, piece of land. So th then some people say, well, put artificial turf, but that's worse <laughs> because it's, it is known to leach heavy metals. It is known to leach PFAS, which you may have heard in the past, I would say, couple of weeks. The, um, the EPA passed a regulations for safety of drinking waters, specifically for PFAS, because those are non-degradable materials that bioaccumulate in the body and are terrible for the environment. So please consider outdoor activities, Thank but not you. in the field. Ms. Mooney. Hi, Council. Um, Elizabeth Mooney, City of Kenmore. Since 1995. Um, so I have lived in Kenmore since 1995, and I'm here to talk about also the shoreline, Lake Point, the birthing channel, the navigation channel, Lake Washington, the ecosystem, the health of our restoration of our salmon in Chichatel and Swamp Creek and Sammamish River. All of that is where we wanna go, right? Spiritual awakening through nature. And you also have a responsibility of public health and safety. We live in an urban area filled with pollution. So before the city incorporated back then, there were dreams of a lake point, like Kirkland's Carolyn Point. That's what I remember. And then we've been through the whole iterations, right? How many? Weedner, you know. We spent money investing in these people who might have turned it into what the owner of Lake Point thought it could become. The Olsons helped, by the way. But anyway, there are several critical issues in that area of our shoreline. If the city is considering making a public park, I applaud us for thinking about that. But if the city is considering making a public park where there is more access to our shared natural resources like Washington's ecosystem, we must inform, educate, verify that there is no public health risk from contaminants on that property. It's just due diligence. Secondly, there is also, of course, a fiscal due diligence. Who are the parties of liability anyway? Who put the trash there that caused there to be a Matka site? Can Kenmore balance the income from the development of the site to offset the long-term cost of maintaining and developing a wonderful park? You gotta test up front. You gotta be transparent. Yeah, who is responsible for the cleanup? You know, there's a, a a legal consent decree for its cleanup. It's industrial right now. That's the way it's sitting right now, status quo. But if you have kids out there playing, you got to think differently with the agencies and our community. We need to have that discussion now and have all these issues brought up to light before it goes to the public taxpayers to vote. Let's not repeat the recent mistakes of the past when the community is not fully informed before voting, there's an obligation. You have to ensure public health and safety and be transparent. Thank you, Ms. Mooney. Mayor Herbig, we have no additional on-site uh, people signed up. Can we move on to virtual comments? Uh, of course. Stacy Valenzuela followed by Patrick O'Brien and Janet Hayes. Ms. Valenzuela, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? You can, go ahead. Thank you. Stacy Valenzuela Kenmore. As part of the concern of raising fees and taxes, the council agreed it was to pass on discounts to our lowest incomes for all utility and taxes, as well as car registration fees. Uh, we need this to cover the percentage of the increases that keep happening, but I do not see them even closely relevant. And is it just me? Or are you moving at the speed of light to get grants and waste more money on Lake Point while making excuses on funding residents' project preferences, cleaning up, 
stationary testing of toxins, Swamp Creek restoration, and the culverts, just to name a few. The residents have come forward numerous times concerning Lake Point, stating that we want the city that cries needing to raise taxes as no funds to stop wasting hundreds of thousands annually as ha they have for the last 20 or more years on another property owner's land with consultants, architects, engineers, etc. I would like to see the city move step five on the memo to the first priority, more than an afterthought to appease us, work with environmental entities to guide the land order owner and hold with enforcement him to actively clean up the contamination from the 2001 consent decree with remediation for the health and safety of all living things in our area. If experts who you consulted about downtown do not live here, they are just hearing from some staff interpretations of what they want for Lake Point of da or downtown. They need to hear from residents, the people that live here, the city council wishes should be represented of the residents' wishes. Please prioritize and include residents' wishes and improvements for all of this. And did I just hear that for Ab Arbor Day, you value trees at the same time you relax the tree ordinance? Which is it? Please advise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Hi there. We can hear you. Go can on. you hear me? Yes. Hi, Pat O'Brien here, Kenmore. Uh, I would just like to say that it hasn't started yet. Yeah. It, I'd just like to say that a little bit later, you're going to hear from our city manager, uh, Rob Carlinzi and Debbie Bent, and they're going to talk about Lake Point, but I would think that they have a severe conflict of interest, much as they had a conflict of interest, Rob did anyway, on the reporting of the suitability for the Kenmore maintenance facility. I'd like to see what a current number for that project, that doom, boondockle is. It's a $20 million doom buckle, and, and we can't have any more of these because this whole project is nothing but risk. Risk, insurance, bonding, expense, staff time. It, you, you absolutely are stepping into the briar patch on this one. Love where you live and, and, and the climate action plan. I want to do everything I can to get rid of the biggest CO2 contributors in this town that are the asphalt and concrete plant. Why would we do anything but do the maximum amount of testing on, on the before during and after and there's several different ways to do dredging too and that hasn't been discussed we have a nice report uh that glacier has handpicked on what's in the water but we also have the 1996 and 2015 army corps of engineers uh, gave a dmmu statement on the high levels of contamination are there that is being brushed under the rug this is necessary to have baseline testing for dioxins, lead, PCBs, and everything else before you even get started, because you need to have the beginning, the middle, and the end results of that. And now the project is going to continue on this permit, even though the scope of work has doubled. Over 80 dump trucks full of material is going to be brought out. And they say, oh, once we get it to the beach, then we'll test it. That's too late, folks. You got to test it in the water and you don't move it if it if it poses a substantial risk. It's fundamental. These items that I'm talking about are non-biodegradable. As the first woman that spoke tonight, who's on your, your ecological advisory committee, they don't just fall apart. They have to be removed and use scientific methods to dispose of them. And you've got no expertise in this. You want to sign off on a park that would be nothing but exposure for children and anybody who goes on that property. It off gases all the time. And you really need to have a blue ribbon panel with people that aren't in the Kenmore government to give their advice. Thank you. Thank you. Janet Hayes. Janet Hayes, can you hear us?
Janet Hayes, I see you're online. Will you unmute? Last call, Janet Hayes. Mayor Herbig, that concludes our list. All right, next on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. And all second, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda is adopted unanimously. Uh, next, we have a presentation, uh, Zipply Fiber, um, Ken Moore, America's Fastest Internet Connect Certification Award, presented by Zipply Fiber Vice President of Marketing, Ryan Luckin. Good evening. Uh, my, good evening, everybody. My name is Ryan Luckin. I'm Vice President of Marketing, Zipply Fiber, and a Ken Moore resident. Um, as you know, Zipply Fiber uh, owns and operates a state-of-the-art fiber optic network uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, including Kenmore. The importance of a fiber optic network in communities large and small uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, many of us are old enough to remember when only one room in the house might have internet access and it was delivered through the home phone. And if mom picked up the phone while you were online, well, you were offline. Um, eventually communities moved to cable-based internet service, sufficient for surfing, surfing the web and downloading MP3s. Um, so long as your neighbors didn't get online when we all got home after work. Um, fast forward to today, there, are, there aren't very many electronics we purchase today when we leave the store that are not connected to the internet. Today, we want the ability to work from home, to stream entertainment, to play games, to access tele, telemedicine, and we want to do this all at the same time throughout our homes. Um, the fiber optic network that Zippy Fiber has delivered to your community is built to scale. It will serve residents for generations. As of today, more than 8,000 addresses in Kenmore um, are served by this network. Thousands of residents and businesses are our customers, and we're truly thankful for their support. Tonight, I'm excited to share that uh, our fiber network is unlike anything else in the entire country. Based on the capabilities of this network and the recent introduction of what's called a 50 gig symmetrical speed tier, um, Zippy Fiber has certified that the city of Kenmore, Washington may now claim to have the fastest residential internet in the entire country. But tonight I present to you uh, this letter of certification signed by our CEO uh, and this award uh, and congratulations to the city of Kenmore and we look forward to serving you for generations. Thank you very much. And why don't we all join over there for a quick photo. All right, and with that, we move straight over to staff report. Uh, first item, Muck Creek Restoration Project presented by Environmental Services Director Richard Sawyer. Good evening. So I'm here this evening to provide uh, a brief update to council and the public on the restoration project being planned at 18727 73rd Avenue Northeast, which is to restore approximately 380 feet of Muck Creek and its adjacent riparian and wetland areas. And Muck Creek is a tributary to uh, Swamp Creek, uh, just to the east side of 73rd Avenue. So this project uh, originally um, is uh, 
or a project was originally required to provide mitigation for the recently completed 68th Avenue Northeast pedestrian and bicycle improvement project, which had unavoidable impacts to previously unknown stream segments identified in figure A that was provided in the agenda bill and I have up on the screen now. The so stream A, B, and C down in the uh, Muck Creek Basin um, uh, were the areas of impact. And originally mitigation uh, was discussed and uh, approved to replace four driveway culverts up in the Blueberry Creek Basin, which is a different tributary to Swamp Creek uh, up off of 202nd. However, staff, uh, uh, dear completion of the project met with uh, tribal staff and uh, Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife biologists to uh, look at the property on 73rd and uh, kind of all reach an agreement that this would be considered an acceptable alternative in lieu of the culvert replacements. And so the new site with the mitigation is kind of on the uh, far right here. Um, that's the uh, property being in uh, the side of the project. And I can zoom in a bit here. So the proposed project, which is shown in figure B, uh, it's a 1.34 acre site that previously contained a single family home and a detached living unit. And uh, for the last several years, uh, both of these had been rented out. Uh, the property had a long history of flooding, as you can see in figure C, provided some photos from a couple different winters. Uh, which occurred basically every winter during heavy rain events. Um, the city uh, was able to finally purchase this property in 2022, and these structures were demolished in 2023. Now the proposed project, which I've shown in figure D, these are 30% design levels that we've um, uh, come to with the, our consultant Osborne Consulting, who's working with us on this project replaces uh, all the, ex the existing impervious areas with native plantings and off-channel habitat. Uh, the project realigns the channel and adds large woody material throughout the, the stretch of the new stream area and develops stable riffle pull stream patterns, which is just kind of a fancy way to say, kind of complicates the, the stream, adds meander, provides um, refuge for different types of fish and, and amphibians and different life stages. Um, and then it's being designed in a way where the uh, um, flows will kind of persist between rain events and provide a lot of a variety of habitat during the winter months. Um, this proposed realignment uh, directs the channel kind of northward onto the property. Um, if you look back at figure E, the Right now, the channel has just been kind of straightened and just kind of straddles the, the, this property and the property to the south before it cuts under 73rd Avenue. Um, but the uh, project, what we'll do is we'll move that uh, northward and add some meander to uh, kind of add that hydraulic complexity I mentioned, uh, as well as increase the channel habitat length. Um, and within the channel, as I mentioned, we have the large woody material, which will provide fish habitat and uh, long-term biodegradable material. Um, the uh, adjacent to the channel, um, we're actually going to add some deep depressions to provide pools for additional kind of low velocity fish and amphibian habitat. Uh, it was, it's hard, kind of hard to see on this map, I apologize, but uh, they're kind of on the eastern to the right side of the property. And I do want to point out that the existing floodplain, the floodplain boundaries will remain relatively the same. Um, so there won't really be any net change in, in how far the extent of the existing flooding goes. Um, however, the uh, where it floods will um, obviously have, you know, it's, it's just kind of a uniform flood right now, but then now there's going to be all the um, more diversity in, in, the, uh, in the channel and these pools and uh, resulting in um, kind of, as I mentioned, just a lot of complexity as we're, you know, we're gonna have plants and trees and, and uh, just uh, a lot of uh, more diversity and habitat happening, which is uh, really good for um, all the wildlife and fish using this area. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, as of uh, a couple weeks ago, we're at 30%. We are, um, rapidly working on design and getting permits uh, completed. Um, and the plan would be if we can 
uh, kind of get those wrapped up in the next month, month and a half, we could probably still target a construction window late this summer. Um, however, uh, there's there's not a real pressing need. Uh, we definitely want to make it take our time and do this right. So uh, if we don't get those done in time to get a good uh, construction bid, we'll just uh, do this in summer 2025. And uh, uh, as far as kind of uh, budget where we're at, the end of the report, you'll see I've kind of provided some figures. Um, so this property was purchased uh, for $680,000 and we did get 75% of that covered with a King County Conservation Futures grant and demolition was about $27,000. And at 30%, we're um, kind of looking at between an 800,000 and $1 million project cost um, and uh, that kind of is getting refined and really the, uh, the number of plants and, and how much grading we want to commit to really is the driving factor on on that cost so we're trying to find that balance of getting the most habitat improvement we can but you know obviously um, on the best budget that we can so happy to take any questions questions Councilmember Marshall Thank you. About two weeks ago, I think there was an article in the Seattle Sunday Times that had a really detailed critique of statewide implementation of the culvert renovations and the whole idea behind it and everything like that a salmon would, every challenge a salmon would face, depending upon whether the improvements are how they're phased, whether it's further upstream or downstream. I think I remember you saying something much earlier about uh, what our purpose was in this and that this project was gonna help or probably could help, I think as you said, to get more bang for the buck or more environmental and ecological impact than maybe those culverts would have been upstream. Is that is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there were a couple of factors. Um, and one you did touch on similar to what the article pointed out, the, the culverts that were identified, um, you know, there were, immediately upstream and downstream barriers. So that was kind of one of the questions I immediately had when this project was handed over was, you know, um, I mean, that's great. Uh, you know, we want to remove fish barriers, but, but what about here and here? I mean, wouldn't it make more sense for us to do something that was kind of more impactful, start downstream and work our way up? And then really that second question I had was, you know, why are we mitigating in the Blueberry Creek Basin when the impacts are clearly down here in the Muck Creek Basin? And the impacts were from um, kind of losing losing some of that riparian and wetland area that we didn't realize um, was flowing along adjacent there. So actually, Muck Creek goes further west than we knew prior to this project. It's actually fed by uh, some wetlands up in the neighborhoods above, and then so that's technically some um, a bit of source of Muck Creek stream water that comes down and then flows under 68th into Muck Creek. Um, so this. Uh, project I think just um, was much more applicable and as I mentioned we went out with the uh, fish and wildlife biologist and the tribal biologist and I think everyone was yeah, you know we're I mean this is going well beyond um, you know what the minimum mitigation would have required uh, and then as I'll point out fiscally um, you know replacing culverts you know I mean it can really vary but you know we've been spending a million plus per culvert um, and we would have had it on four of those uh, in this project, as I mentioned, was, uh, you know, we're looking at around a million for the project and then that 680,000 for all the acquisition, which again was covered predominantly by CFT grants. Yeah. Any other questions? Councilman McCulver. Yeah, briefly, I mean, this rocks, uh, good to see it. Uh, I, I just had a question about us discovering it. it. Does that also imply like there might be others out there? Like we could well stumble across more streams and creeks and et cetera. Like, is that to be expected, I guess? Or was this something of an anomaly? Uh, we've kind of had our eye on this property a while. Um, it would frequently exchange hands in summertime. And then my team would be out there in winter answering a lot of questions about why people's stuff was floating around. Um, and then finally just work with the property owner and CFT to just get this property. And, and then it aligned well with this, you know, using as mitigation for the other. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there are um, other properties uh, just, just waiting for restoration. And we actually are becoming more proactive and looking for and identifying those. 
uh, particularly in the Swamp Creek Basin, we've been uh, running an analysis to find um, good restoration projects that kind of give you a good bang for the buck. Cool, thank you so much. Any other questions? All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. Thank you very much, Richard. Next on the agenda, Love Relive Project Community Engagement Update presented by Communications Specialist, Lauren Homiak. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm here tonight to present a very brief update about community engagement in phase two of the Love Where You Live project. So just a little background about what got us here. The Love Where You Live project is our year-long community engagement effort that began last summer, kicked off in June of 2023 with the goal of gathering broad feedback from the community on their values and priorities for the future of Kenmore. Uh, we were inspired by the dream play build method, which encourages people to use their hands and be a little bit more creative um, when they're thinking about um, visions for their community. And another goal was to engage with as many community members as possible to learn about those priorities. Uh, so a quick phase one recap. Um, phase one of the Love Where You Live project took place in June through December of last year, and it included our first uh, statistically valid community survey Again, just looking for broad feedback about the direction the city's heading and um, goals that our community has for the future. Uh, we also participated in over 22 community engagement booths at events and activities all summer. And through that outreach, we uh, collected over 1,100 responses and ideas. And when we combed through those responses, the top two themes that emerged were community spaces and economic development. And that was part of the report that we presented back in January, if you recall. And um, both of these top themes, when you looked at those subcategories, included a really strong interest in future development planning for downtown and for Lake Point. So as we moved into phase two of our engagement, we wanted to dive in a little bit deeper on um, those two themes and those particular spaces. So phase two so far has um, been underway since February and it has included four in-person Love Where You Live community workshops. We went out to Kenmore Middle School, the Kenmore Community Club, Moreland's Elementary and The Hangar. Um, the Hangar was by far the most well attended, but all four nights we had great participation um, and we had over 200 uh, participants total between the four workshops. And we set out big tables and uh, six foot long maps of downtown and Lake Point, and then a whole bunch of found objects, clay and blocks. And we asked people to build 3D expressions of their vision for the future of those two spaces. So it was cool because people could actually build directly on the maps on the table and move things around and talk to each other about um, everything everybody was building. We also had a uh, short accompanying online survey that I put out to make sure if anyone couldn't come to the workshops, they had a chance to uh, share their feedback in particular about downtown and Lake Point. And with that online survey, we got 128 responses. So between the four workshops and the online survey, we collected uh, 550 new ideas and responses in phase two. Uh, here's a few photos from the workshops. Just overall, it was uh, really positive to be back out in the community, connecting with people directly. Um, I'm someone who worked the first few years during the pandemic, so it's so nice to just have in-person events back and um, was a really positive way for the community to connect directly with staff. Um, staff was open to talking about a lot of other um, projects and things going on in the city besides just Lake Point and downtown and just provided a great space for um, some positive connection with the community. Uh, you can see Hank came to one of our uh, events and made an appearance. So it was awesome to have our new mascot there. And um, overall, just great to be out in the community, out of City Hall. Um, it was kind of new spaces and new faces at each of the events. Um, I met with people that I've never seen before, never connected with before, and each location kind of had a different vibe and a different flair. So I just think it's so worthwhile to get out of this building and connect with people in different spaces. So 
Thank you to the community for showing up, but also thank you to our community partners, the North Shore School District, um, you know, helping secure Kenmore Middle School and Moreland's Elementary. And then um, Kenmore Community Club was a great event space to, to hold a community event as well. So um, thank you to everybody who worked to make these workshops a success. Uh, phase two continues beyond just the workshops. Uh, we had a second statistically valid survey that was administered at the end of March. Um, again, EMC Research administered that one and we received over 300 responses and we just got the results back about a week ago. Um, and so that wrapped up nicely. And then uh, we're moving on to kind of the final steps of phase two. So we're currently coding, organizing and analyzing all the results that we received from the workshops and also from the statistically valid survey, we're looking at themes and um, you know how to present all of that data to you. So that more information is coming soon. We'll be at the uh, we'll be presenting results from the survey and the workshops at the April 26th City Council retreat in Leavenworth, and also again on May 6th at the City Council meeting, taking an even deeper dive into those results. Um, and or then can I jump you, in for a second? Oh, Yes. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be pretty tight for time at the retreat. Uh, so the the presentation you'll get there will be more high level and just hit the high points. And then the then on May six you'll get a more in depth analysis. Yes, you'll have a lot more data coming your way. Um, a few other just next steps that are happening coming up here soon is um, discussing Lake Point at the April twenty six City Council retreat and some funding options will be presented there. And then um, next steps for downtown, our other theme will be discussed when the Urban Land Institute presents their final report in June. They were here in March and um, we're looking forward to their recommendations as we consider a path forward for um, downtown, the future of downtown. So that was it for my short update tonight. Um, thank you to each of you who came to the workshops. Um, again, they were just, I think, a really wonderful way to connect and um, get more feedback. And I appreciated you guys coming too. So thank you. Um, I'm open to questions, but stay tuned because you'll hear a lot more from me in the next few weeks. Questions, comments? Uh, Councilmember Member Shrebnik. It's not a question. This was, these were just great. I just want to thank you and thank Richard for his presentation too. I just, I'm loving all three of these today and just wanted to call that out. Any other comments or questions? Mr. City Manager. Yeah, I just want to compliment Lauren and her leadership on all this. This has been quite the project over the last year and it's definitely memorable and um, thanks just goes to Lauren and her creativity and her hard work and, and fitting all this in and, and getting such great feedback. And there's now a lot of momentum behind this right now. And so I think we need to uh, acknowledge that and um, take advantage of that momentum while we have it. So thank you so much, Lauren. Good job. Yeah, I really enjoyed the uh, two that I was able to attend at the middle school and at the community club. And I have to say it was, um, I really think giving folks a different way to give their input to the city is really valuable versus just, you know, polling folks or giving people stickers to put on whiteboards or whatever. I actually think having people use their hands opens up a different like part of the brain and a different way of communicating. And, and it was really interesting to look at all the maps that people were putting together. What I the one theme I saw, and, and I saw it on one of your slides there, is 522 and, and trying to figure out how we fix the wound throughout the city that is 522 and connect both sides. Because um, that was something that I saw on so many different maps. Yeah, with different connectivity was huge in Lake Point and downtown, both of those. Yeah. yeah. Those are all things that we'll have to tackle and it'll be super complicated, I'm sure. So anyway, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And... Last but not least, uh, downtown and Lake Point update presented by City Manager Rob Carlinzi and Community Development Director Debbie Bent. Good evening, Council. I don't know if I'm the last or the least. I'll, I'll take either one. So this will be a very, <laughs> very quick update. Um, relating to downtown, you heard uh, from Lauren on the community engagement process, so that's where there's some overlap here, so we're excited to incorporate that 
feedback as we move forward with uh, implementation for downtown. On the planning side, the planning commission docket includes an update of the downtown and community design element. They'll be bringing a recommendation forward to you later this year and then an ordinance adoption at the end of the year. Uh, we're also fortunate to have the Urban Land Institute Technical Advisory Panel uh, come to Kenmore for a, a two, uh, one and a half day intensive to kind of take a look at downtown and explore some ideas of what might stimulate the next phase of downtown. That final report is due in June, and that will then be presented to both the Council and the Planning Commission, and ideas from that report could then be incorporated into the comprehensive plan or a future downtown strategy as an implementation measure. So that's it for downtown. Um, for Lake Point, again, you, you heard from Lauren, there has been sort of a, a great community engagement for Lake Point to get some ideas for how to move forward with that and that community engagement will continue. Uh, we are continuing to work with the property owner to develop preliminary terms for potential acquisition of some Lake Point property for where well, that's related to shoreline restoration and park development, and also exploring the potential for partnering on a request for qualification or request for proposal process, looking for a potential de developer who might develop the rest of the Lake Point property into a walkable urban village. Um, the, uh, we we've have applied for several grants related to shoreline acquisition. Those have been submitted. Determination on those grant awards will be later this year. There is no commitment yet to move forward related to acquisition, but it, for, from a timing standpoint, this is when the grant applications were open. So that's the reason why we submitted those applications when we did. And the level of due diligence necessary for if it to be done before acquiring any potential property is to be determined, uh, recognizing there will need to be some level of environmental testing and studies and any other kind of studies necessary to give assurance to the city before that acquisition proceeds. A funding strategy, including sources of revenue and expenditure and a schedule is to be determined. And obviously you need to kind of look at a soup to nuts approach for this, looking at revenue and expenditures needed to complete due diligence, land acquisition, community engagement, and then what you will need then for shoreline restoration, whether that's through the design, permitting, construction, and ongoing maintenance. And similarly for park concepts, looking at design, permitting, construction, and ongoing maintenance. The revenue sources could include grant funding and also potential ballot measure, whether that's in 2024 or 2025. And so the options for council consideration related to a funding strategy will be brought forward for an initial discussion at the April council retreat and then for future meetings in May. But as you can imagine, there are a lot of moving parts on this. And so again, I've tried to outline at least basically what is happening on the Lake Point site. There's a lot of unknowns right now, a lot to be determined and recognizing that the funding piece is a key piece before making a decision to move forward. Um, any questions? Questions? Council Member Culver? And just to underscore, so we're going to have a sort of preliminary discussion at the retreat, but I think the bigger one's going to be at the follow up May 6th. Is that right? Nods. Okay, cool. Thank you. Councilor Sasson. Uh, just a comment. I feel um, like we are on track to address the issues that have come up with multiple citizens today. Um, Ms. Mooney, um, uh, focusing on community education and transparency. And I just want to say that you're on, you appear to be on track and I'm looking forward to hearing more. So thank you. City manager. Yeah, thank you council member Sasson for highlighting that. And um, yeah, you heard public comment earlier tonight talking about the need for really strong due diligence on the property. And I agree, we need to know exactly what we would be purchasing if that's the direction we would go. Um, the good news is we do have um, some 
possible grant sources that we've applied for, as Debbie mentioned, that can help us. But again, be, before we went too far down this road, we would need to follow very carefully Department of Ecology guidance and uh, get the necessary information and testing needed for the property well in advance. So wholeheartedly agree with that. Any other questions or comments? Just one more thing. I think as a community, we, all, we also need to be considering the cost of doing nothing. You know, I feel like we, we, we have been talking for years about doing something and we're not sure what that is, but there is associated cost with not doing anything. We, what we want is to do something right, but um, continuing to do nothing, not where we're headed. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. I just want to thank Council Member Sasson's comment about the cost of doing nothing. As a community, we've looked at that property my entire life. I'm thankful that the voices on this council and the members of our community have been heard and that we have staff that is committed to taking a methodical approach with due diligence with regard to ecology and the environment and communication to our community. I am very hopeful that we will be able to make important progress on this critical area in Kenmore. And I'm thankful for all the work that's taken place so far. I know it's going to be a big lift. So thank you. And again, there is a cost to doing nothing. And I think very important thing for us to consider as a council and for our community as you're bringing forth comments to our council about this and the future of our city. Thank you. Councilmember Shrebnik. I too wanna to thank Councilmember Sasson for hitting the nail on the head. There's a cost for doing nothing. And it's both, you know, obviously everybody would love a park there, but I, I think one of our audience members brought up the cost of doing nothing for environmental restoration. I mean, this is a, a huge opportunity. Um, right now where there is not a developer knocking at the door of the property owner. So I, I couldn't be more excited about the potential of this. This is the, I have to say, rivals the most exciting moment <laughs> that I've been on council. Councilor Lutzitz. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues on the council for their comments. But I think also it's important um, to consider the other side of that as well as, as although there's a cost to doing nothing, um, this is an opportunity in which we can involve and engage the public in what they want to see there. It's We're not acting just to act, but we're creating a very thorough plan um, for what that site uh, will become and what benefit that will provide our community in involving our, our community every step of the way uh, in terms of what that vision is. So we, we are formulating that plan and, and we're going to make sure that 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 property will be something that um, all can enjoy and, and find, find benefit in. And I agree with my colleagues here. I think the um allowing the status quo to continue is not something that I think the community is interested in. And I think um, the opportunities there are too great to not at least take a hard look at the opportunity that we have in front of us to, uh, to build something for the community. Of course, doing so while we um, you know, are extremely careful with how we go about doing it because we are, um, nobody wants to take on risk that we don't need to take on or liabilities that we don't wanna, that we don't wanna have. We want to do this. We want to do this right. So it's going to take some time. It's going to take some input from community. And at the at the end of the day, the potential there is, I mean, it's just generational investment if we can get this right. So appreciate it. All right. Other staff report. Nothing else, Your Honor. Thank you. Council member reports and comments. Council member Culver. I was going to see if we could get done by eight o'clock. We're going to be very close. Let's be quick. Council member Marshall. I got to quote Dr. Seuss for Arbor Day, right? So unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better 
it's not. But I think we're trying to really do all we can to make sure it does get there. Councilmember Sasson. I think we're gonna need to eat our Wheaties at the retreat. <laughs> I'm starting to get excited and looking forward to all it, but I'm I'm sensing a fire hose coming. <laughs> Council Member Shrebnik. A uh, couple of meetings. Um, King Conservation District, um, they are working on their uh, rate structure, which will come to the voters in 2025. We've got a couple of committees I'm on where that's the case. Um, they're looking at a couple percent increase and their rate structure is over a parcel. Um, it is not based on um, the mill rate like a prop reg regular property tax, I would say. Um, so right now the rate is about um, $11 per parcel and I think it'll maybe go up a dollar or two. That's what they're looking at. Nothing is, there's a, a significant process over the next eight, nine months to get to that point, but they are, um, it's just sort of early information at this point, they're looking at a slight increase. Um, the other meeting recently was the uh, Regional Policy Committee, um, and they um, are diligently working on reviewing the um, crisis care uh, levy implementation plan. And I think I mentioned that before, but there are now several amendments um, that are being looked at primarily having to do with the um, relationship between the cities and the county. Should the cities um, find it difficult to site these facilities? Um, in the north uh, area here, we are lucky that we have um, a facility that's going to be opened uh, very soon already. Um, and they did, I, I mentioned before, there were some issues between them and the county that needed to be resolved, and they are. So they um, will be proposing that site as the north site um, for the crisis care levy dollars. Councilor Lutzis. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get done by 8 p.m. as <laughs> Councilmember Culver had hoped, but I did want to really quickly thank our city staff for all the hard work that they have been doing. Um, you know, thank you to Richard and his team for all the work when it comes to uh, the restoration preservation down in Swamp Creek, a critical part of our community. Uh, special thank you to Lauren and, and all of her work and her folks as well for the community engagement. It's been no easy task and it's something that's absolutely necessary and helps us uh, make the best decisions we can. And then thank you, of course, to, to Debbie and, and her team for all the, the heavy lifting when it comes to planning a downtown and a Lake Point. There's a lot there. So special thank you to, to those three and everyone um, for, for all the work that they do for our community. So Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Um, I think, yeah, I think after our last meeting, or the, I wasn't here last week, but um, at the end of March, I attended Puget Sound Regional Salmon, or Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council meeting. Um, and on behalf of, you know, Raya 8 and it was a full productive meeting. They are going to Washington to advocate on behalf of Salmon. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to doing with Raya 8 and as a representative on Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council is advocating for this important work at the mouth of Lake Washington and seeing what we can do to really bring the energy and funds that we need to our city to get this critical work done for our region. So that's, you know, ongoing, but I'm very thankful for the updates that we have today and feeling um, really good about the direction we're moving and that we will be able to get the support we need to get this critical work done. So thank you. Not much report. Uh, there was an ETP meeting uh, last Friday. We got to um, we got to meet the Sound Transit interim CEO, Goran Sparman. Uh, we also got an update on the Sound Transit uh, BRT uh, timeline, as well as um, a reminder that the uh, Sound Transit Line 2 will be opening the day after our retreat on the 27th of April. Um, should be a lot of fun. I may still be in Leavenworth though that day, so I might miss it. But if you can be there, it should be, should be a good time. So 
Anyway, with nothing more to come before us, Kenmore City Council is adjourned.